This morning's scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 10. Um, I will be reading verses 1 through 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus says, I am the door. It's one of the I am statements of Jesus from the Gospel of John. There are seven of them where Jesus uses that phrase, I am, and then he gives an image. He gives a picture of us for us of what he is and who he is, and it gives us a way to think about him as his disciples. And if you're not a disciple, if you're thinking about what it means to, to be a disciple, these images give you a great way to understand who he is. So we're going through them in the Gospel of John. They're all in the Gospel of John. We're going through them in order, and we get to this one, I am the door. And I I thought this week as I was thinking about this and studying it, it's probably the I am statement that I've studied the least. It's the one that I haven't thought about. Probably, I've thought about it the least of all of the different images. And I would have to say for me, it's the one that captures my imagination the least. Because doors are just kind of a little bit mundane. They're sort of every day. Some of the other I am statements to me just feel more. I am the light of the world. That's so cosmic. And light versus darkness is this paradigm and is this, it's this image which is inherent in our culture where light represents life and it represents togetherness and it represents being illuminated and darkness is isolation and despair. That makes a lot of sense and it captures our imagination. Or even when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. To think about Jesus as the bread of life, you say, he is what comes in and sustains me. And bread and food is not only something that sustains you, but it's also at the center of everything joyful. When you go to a wedding or a birthday party or any kind of gathering, there's food at the center. And so that image, you say, oh, Jesus is at the center of all things. He feeds me. He sustains me. But Jesus as the door is just so, it's so humdrum. We see doors everywhere. And here is where I think Jesus is such a master teacher. Did you know that Jesus is a master teacher? Did you know that every word that he has is a gift for you? It's something that can give you life this really mundane image of Jesus as the door, he knows what he's doing as a good teacher. Because the everydayness and the mundaneness of this image makes it so that you're going to have to confront it all the time. When you leave this place today, you're going to have to go through several doors just to even get out onto the street. When you get home, you're going to have to pass through probably two or three doors When you get home tonight and you walk from your living room to your bedroom and to the bathroom, each time you're going to be going through a door. When you get up tomorrow morning and you enter into your life, you're going to leave your bedroom and you're going to go through a door and you're going to go out into the world and you're going to go through a door. And each one of those occasions is going to be a little sermon preached by Jesus to you. He's going to be saying, I'm there at every step. Whatever path you choose to take in life, I'm going to be there. It's this little message that he's giving us. It's not just the light. It's not just that he's the truth. He's the door. And each time you see one, it's a sermon that he's preaching to you. And he says, I want you to come through me. I want you to come into me. He wants you to to enter into what he has for you. Every time you see a door, there he is. 
So I want us to look at this, this passage and this teaching as sort of every day as it is, it has a lot of layers to it. And there are three ways that Jesus is illuminating what it means for him to be the door. Friends, he is the door of your souls. He is the door for your neighbors, and he's also the door to the world. That's all here in this passage. And if you want to look along, if you brought a Bible, that's great. If you didn't, it's right here uh, on the back of your bulletin. Let's look at the first thing. He is the door for your souls. And this one is the most basic it's the one that's right out there in the front, and you can see it in verse 9. In verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. There's real simplicity there. Jesus is simply saying, if you want to be saved, if you want to experience spiritual safety and comfort and assurance, if you want to be in the place where where you are meant to be, then you have to go through Jesus. There's, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of complexity here. He's simply saying, if you want to be in the place where your souls are taken care of, you need to come to where I am and walk through me. That out there in the world, and we'll get to this in a second, there's danger in the world. It's not to vilify the world, but it's to tell the truth about the way that the world is, that our hearts and our minds and our bodies were not meant to be on our own. We weren't meant to be sheep wandering all by ourselves. Jesus says, you have to come through me and I want you to walk through the door. There's this phrase that John uses a couple times. He uses it in the Gospel of John. He uses it in one of his letters. And he says, what human beings, what God wants for us is he wants us to pass from death to life. You are supposed to pass from death to life. And most of the time we think about this word pass, we use it mostly to talk about passing away, dying, moving from life to death. And that's something that just happens to you. It hits you. It, it, it might come as a surprise. It might come, you know it's coming, but we're all going to pass from life to death. And that's something that's going to happen to us that we have no choice over. And Jesus says there is another pass, uh, path that you can choose. And it's to pass from death to life. He says it several times, and it can be coupled with this verse, that you have the choice to move from death to life. Every single one of you do. That you can move from a place of, of death, of deprivation, of not being in the place where you can be sustained to a place of eternal life. We pass through all sorts of doors every day of our lives. You're going to pass through thousands of doors in your life. There's one door who's a person. And Jesus says, I'm that door. I want you to pass through me. Jesus says, I'm coming because I know about spiritual architecture. I know the spiritual architecture of this world, and I know the spiritual architecture of your heart. And what you need is I want you to pass into life through me. Now, there are several things here that we probably wouldn't know unless we were in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, but you get to know them because I'm about to tell them and I have a bunch of fancy books at home that say what it's like to be a shepherd 2,000 years ago. I'm about to say these things right now. Jesus, look at verse one. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. We're thinking about doors. We're thinking about, sometimes the translation is gate. There's a picture that would have popped into the minds of folks in the ancient Near East, and it's like this. Nearly every sheepfold looked the same in most rural communities. They might have been a little bit different in detail, but the basic gist of it was this. Either right alongside of a house or in the courtyard of a village, there was an enclosed space. It was made of wood, sometimes of stone, and oftentimes it was covered, and there was one entryway. And that entryway was for sheep, and they would be there for the night, and oftentimes there was more than one shepherd, more than one flock. They would all be stored in one place. They would go out for the day and they would eat and they would be watered and they would be led around by the shepherd. And then at night they would be led back into the one door. And they would be led into the safety of the sheepfold because at night there's more predators and there's more chances to get in trouble. And the shepherd leads the sheep in. And once they're led into the sheepfold where there is safety, the shepherd, there usually would be one shepherd, who would then lay at the door of the sheepfold and sleep there for the night so that anybody who was going to come out or come in would have to go through the door. And this is the picture that Jesus is giving us, that he's the point of entry into this place of safety. 
And that's what, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. This is what kind of makes Christianity a little different than any other religion, because most religions say, I can tell you about the pathway to get to life. Here's the things that you need to do to get to life, to get to acceptance with God, or to get to a rich, full existence. And Jesus comes and he says, I am the point of entry. I am the way to get there. And he says it over and over and over again. In John 1, he says, I'm the ladder that reaches down from heaven. He's the entryway. Or to Nicodemus, he says, anybody that believes in me passes into life. Or in John 14, where he says, I'm the way. This is putting before all of us, whether we're Christians or not, the fact that we have before us this, this king, this savior, it's not about doing things. It's not about being able to achieve certain things. It's about just entering into him. He's the point of entry, and it means you have to do something. It means to experience the door. You know, like, if you want to know what a door is, you have to go through it. That's the very nature of doorness as you walk through it. If it was a window, you can stand, like right now I'm looking out the window, and the window is functioning just fine because I can see boats and I can see New Jersey. Is that New Jersey over there? Or is it just, is it Queens? I don't even know. Uh, it wouldn't be Queens this far downtown. I'm still getting my bearings. Don't make fun of me. Um, a window you look through, and it's functioning just fine. I'm very far away from it. But if I want to go through a door... I have to move towards it. I have to make a decision. And this is what Jesus is saying. You have to make a decision to move towards him, to move into him. For something to change in your life, you have to move towards him so you can enter into what's good. When I was in college, I went to Alaska and worked for the summer in a fish packing plant. If you're in college, if you are uh, not in college, if you're thinking about doing that, I probably wouldn't do it if I was you. Um, it's very messy and it's very smelly. And so for a summer I spent uh, in this fish packing plant. One of the things that you had to do when you were at the fish packing plant is you would work a shift from seven to seven. And then they would ask people if they wanted to work overtime. And the way you worked overtime was they took five or six of us and we got on a big boat and we went into the harbor and all these little fishing boats through the night would come with what they had caught during the day. And we, as the people who were doing it, we would jump into their boat and throw the fish into this big sort of metal bucket, and then they would put it in there, and we did that all night. And you'd see a little boat come up, and you'd jump into their boat, and you'd do that, and it was 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock and 2 in the morning. And it doesn't matter how much you tuck in the rubber pants that they give you and tuck in your boots, you finally feel that trickle of cold water going down your boot and then filling up and it gets colder and colder and the, and the water begins to rise inside of your rubber overalls and it's just freezing. And one of the nights that I did this, the very last boat that came up, it must have been about two or three in the morning and they came up and the fisherman who came, he lived on that boat. And we jumped into his boat, we threw all his fish into the other boat and I could see into where he and his family lived, and his wife was still up, and they had a little kitchen. And it was dark. In fact, it was just beginning to get light. It was kind of the dawn was coming. And I could see into, and it was misting, and it was cold, and I was freezing, and I was exhausted. And I could see inside the manager of our boat talking with the two of them, and they were sitting in a nice warm kitchen. And they were sitting, and I could see a little stove. And I was on the outside, and I was looking. And the woman caught eyes with me, and I looked at her, and she said, come in. And I thought, I cannot go in there. I am covered in fish guts. I am absolutely frozen. I'm wet. I can't go in there. And I said, no. And she said, no, 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 come in, come in. And so the two or three of us that were working, we moved in, and we opened the door, and we went inside. And I was so embarrassed. I didn't want to sit. This is their house. This is where they live. And she said, do you want to sit down? I said, I probably shouldn't. No, just go ahead and sit down. And she had one of those little stoves that would be in like this little houseboat. And on there was jarred spaghetti sauce. Now, I'm Italian. And jarred spaghetti sauce is against my religion. <laughs> and so I don't usually do that. If you do that, that's fine. It's no, it's just against my religion. And she had a pot of spaghetti with the jarred spaghetti sauce. And she said, 
do you want some of this? <laughs> and dear friends, that was the best spaghetti sauce that I ever had in my life. And I wouldn't have got to have it. I wouldn't have been fed by her. I wouldn't have experienced the warmth as opposed to the cold outside unless I had walked through the door. That's what you have to do. You have to walk through the door. And so right now, very practically to bring this point to a close, how do you do that? You're thinking, I'm a Christian or I'm not a Christian, but how do you do that? Because I think all of us have to continually do it again and again each time we see Jesus as the door. I just want you to know, it's not that you obey what Jesus says. It's not that you do certain things for him. It's not that you become a better person. All those things God is calling you to do, what he wants you to do is just come in. That's what you have to do. You have to believe that he loves you that much and that he wants you to come in and be part of his family and to make home with you. That's what you're supposed to do. That's this first point. Jesus is the door of your souls and you always have the opportunity to enter in. You always do. That's the first thing. Jesus is the door of your souls. Now, here's the next thing. He's the door for your neighbors. And you see this in verse 2 and 3. And here's where you can see how much of a master teacher Jesus is. Because the images that he uses kind of shift and morph a little bit. They change. Look at closely at verses 2 and 3. It says, this is Jesus now. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. You read this passage, I read it, and when I first looked at it, I said, okay, who's who here? What's going on? Okay, we enter Jesus by the door. He's the door. I'm looking at verse 2, and then I say, oh, the shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep, and the sheep hear his voice. Well, we know who the shepherd is, right? It's Jesus. It's just like a children's sermon. You know, if you go to a church with a children's sermon, the answer to every question is Jesus. And you're looking at this passage and you say, who's the shepherd in verse 2? Oh, you say, oh, I've been to a big fancy church with stained glass. Jesus is the shepherd. Hang on. The shepherd that's being talked about here is you. It's God's people. Jesus is saying he's going to call himself a shepherd later on in this chapter. But I want to show you closely here. That Jesus is the shepherd for your neighbors. I'm sorry, he's the door for your neighbors. And you are the shepherd that's supposed to help your neighbors get in. Here, I'm going to show it to you. One of the ways you can't see it very well, uh, because the translation is a little strange. Look at verse 2, where it says, He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. That's not a great translation. It says, He who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. The Greek word ho, which means the, is not there. It's later when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. But more kind of strictly literal translations translate this. He who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. But you don't have to have uh, knowledge of Greek to see this. Look closely. This doesn't depend on Greek grammar. Who are the people that are told to enter the door? It's the sheep. And then in verse 2, he says, once you enter by the door, you become a shepherd. You don't quit being a sheep. You don't quit being a precious lamb that God loves, that he's going to take care of. But now you are a shepherd too. Jesus says here, he's shifting around. He himself shifts around in this. We hear that Jesus is the lamb of God in chapter 1. We hear he's the door. We hear he's the shepherd. It kind of moves around, and it's the same for you. You are a sheep but you're also a shepherd. If you have received this call to be a sheep and to be loved by Jesus and saved by him, then you are also a shepherd. And now it means that you have to think about the door as a place that you're trying to get other sheep into. Your friends and your communities and your family, you are called now to be a shepherd and help them to see how beautiful it is to enter in by the door of Jesus. So Jesus is making it really clear here. The highest priority of any community of sheep should also be that of being a shepherd. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. Whose voice? Your voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You and I are called to be sheep. Now here's what this makes me think of. It makes me think of our church. It makes me think of Lower Manhattan Community Church. When I think about people being shepherds, when I think about what a community is going to do and be, it makes me think of this church. Now, if you're new to this church and you don't know much about it, then you and I are in the same boat. 
because I have been here. I don't know if you know this. Many of you who have been here for a while know this. I have been here less than a month as the lead pastor. I've been to this church literally five times. So there's a lot that I don't know. But here are a few things that I do know. I do know that in the lifespan of this church that God has been at work in really powerful ways. Bringing his salvation, bringing his love, bringing healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, drawing people into the family of God. I know that in the length of the span of this church, that the pastors and the elders and the leaders and the servants of this church, the worshipers in this church, have been equipped by God to do beautiful things and work in the kingdom of God. I know that's true. I've heard enough stories. And I also know this is true. That just like any community, there's been brokenness here too. There's been difficulty. And some of it is not specific to LMCC. The pandemic tore at the fabric of almost every social community of any kind in the city and around the world. We all know this. That when you're not able to really meet together for a year or 18 months or any of those kinds of things that we had to face in the pandemic, that tears at the fabric of a community. It says in Hebrews that you should meet together to encourage one another. And when you're not able to meet together, then you don't get encouraged and you're not able to encourage other people. And it means that things begin to erode. And so it means that some people move away and it means that some people quit coming and it feels like things are kind of dissipating a little bit. Some of it is specific to this church. And there has been difficulty in this church in all kinds of ways that you'll find in any kind of community. And that there are wounds, I'm sure, I know, I've only been here a short time, but I'm sure of this, that there have been wounds that you have felt that have been inflicted maybe even by people in this church, maybe even people that worked at this church. There's a, a, a sin of, um, a prayer of confession of sin in the Book of Common Prayer, and it says, Lord, we confess the things that we have done and the things we have left undone. And that's true when you're in a community like this one, any church. Sometimes there are things that should have been done, but they weren't. And sometimes there are things that should never have been done, and they were. And so now we're in a new season in this church. We're trying to chart our path forward and try to think, okay, how are we going to move forward into this new time where we can love one another, when we can, we can shed things that we're going to let go of and we're going to take up the things that have been really good. How do you do that? And me as the lead pastor, here's my temptation. My temptation is to say, let's take care of us. Let's make sure that we get us in the door and let's take, make sure that we take care of the people that are here and that's it and kind of circle the wagons and say, here's what we're going to do in the community. We're going to make sure everything, we're going to kind of repair, and we're going to fix, and we're going to love each other. And if there's any spare energy left over, what we're going to do is then we're going to spend a little bit of that to try to get people in the door. And Jesus says here, if you are a sheep, then you've become a shepherd. And it means that your heart, when you've known the love of Jesus, it means that you want to share the love of Jesus. If you know what it means to be loved, You want others to know that too. And so the call, this is the call that I'm making to all of us, to help the door of Jesus to be the door for your neighbors too. The people that you know in your communities, the people that you know in your apartment complexes, the people that you know at work, to invite them into the love and the grace and beauty of Jesus. And it will mean helping people to know the doors that are here in this building. And it will mean helping people to know the doors of your own heart and to share with them the love that Jesus has given. This is the call that is given to everybody. Look at verse 3. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. It means knowing the names of the people around you. I have already seen, I want to make this clear, people being good shepherds, I've already experienced that in this community. People caring for me, and for my family, and loving and caring for the people that I know, let's keep doing that. Let's keep manifesting the love that Jesus has given us so that other people can know, the people that we know can come in through the door. That's the second thing here. It's the door for your neighbors too. Here's the last thing, and it's the door to the world. Would you take a look at verse 3 one more time? It says, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. 
it's a weird thing to say because he's saying, I want you to come in. I want you to come into the sheepfold and I want you to be safe. I want you to experience the salvation that comes from Jesus. Come in. And then it says he's going to lead them out. What does that mean? Knowing a little bit more about the sheepfolds of the Middle East will help us here. Like I said, oftentimes these sheepfolds would uh, hold a lot of different shepherd sheep. And at night, they would all be brought in, and this is how they would get out. Shepherds would show up, and they would be around the sheepfold, and each one of them would have a distinctive call. And sometimes it was with a little whistle, and sometimes it was a certain phrase that they sang. But each one of, the, each one of those sheep would know the call of its shepherd, and each one of them would follow the shepherd and go out. They don't just stay in the sheepfold. If you stay in the sheepfold then you never get fed and you don't get to go out into pasture and you don't go in and out. And that's what Jesus says that you and I are called to as people that are hearing the call of a shepherd. So Jesus calls people out into the world. And it means that when we come out from this place, it means we get to go out into the world and do great things because he's leading us. His love is leading us and his power is leading us. Like I said, I've already experienced this a whole bunch in the short time that I've been here in this, in this church that I've experienced people hearing the call of their shepherd and saying, we should pray for one another. Or we should write and perform music in a way that invigorates people to know Jesus. It sometimes has happened in the context of this church. It sometimes happened outside of this church. I've met with people who are working on policies to help our justice system work better. That's a door out to the world that Jesus is leading them into. Or people making art that is beautiful and sustaining. Or people using the gifts that God has given them to do things in the world that reflects his love. There are unique ways that only you can love the people in your life. There are unique gifts that only you have. And when you hear the voice of your shepherd leading you out into the world, he's leading you to go out. It's the same thing that verse 9 says. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. When the sun comes up, it's time for the sheep to go out and to go out into the world because their shepherd is taking them to do good things. Dear friends, your shepherd is calling you not only to enter into him, but also to go out into the world and do good things. He's going to go with you and he's going to lead you. Listen to his voice and follow him. Would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you are our shepherd, but we give you thanks also that you are the gate, the door to which we can enter into eternal life, that we can enter into the safety of the sheepfold. We give you thanks that you call us there so that we can be equipped and sustained not only to stay there, but to go out. I give you thanks for this church and for this community. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Help us to be not only sheep, but also shepherds. Help us to hear your voice and to follow you. Give us those unique ways that only we can do that. Sustain us now. Give us strength now to follow you. We give you thanks that you do not leave us alone to do these things, but you go with us. So go with us now. Be with us now as we continue to feast, as we continue to worship, as we continue to receive your love. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.